Well, we are wrapping up the 16th chapter of Isaiah. Um, let's see, you're tall. Can you yank, or you got it? Okay. Got a little wind blowing up here. Okay. How you guys doing? You all right? Okay. So, <clears throat> last week, we, did, we just went through the first five verses of Isaiah 16, and it was a ton of prophecy that had to do with uh, the end of the tribulation when Remnant hid and, and Petra and Jesus came and broke him out. It was a big dramatic thing, lots of music and drums banging and stuff in my head anyway. So we're going to pick up the, the second half of this. Now remember, we were talking about last week, this chapter 16 is a prophecy of the destruction of Moab. It was, it was the burden of Moab. And even though this prophecy, and there's a really cool thing I'm going to show you tonight. I'm going to have to give you some numbers, a little bit complicated, a little bit. But anyway, this was the prophecy that was given to Isaiah for Moab before all this stuff happened Moab, and then historically it all happened, but it also had the dual purpose of the prophecy of the future. And that would be our, well, probably not our time, we're not going to be here, but it would it prophesied the, the end time, the, the coming of Jesus. So we're going to be picking it up in verse 6 as we move on through the rest of this chapter. Amen. Let's open a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. And we thank you for this cool book of Isaiah that we're just digging through here, Lord, and Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us now, to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts for the message you have for us in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now, we're going to see some stuff here as we're kind of cruising through this thing tonight. And the cool thing about prophecy is this. It always, prophecy is always fulfilled. Whatever God's word, whatever the prophecy is that God gives, it is always fulfilled. And as we've been going through Isaiah, we've been seeing this crazy dual prophecy from back in the 7th century B.C. all the way through to the end of Tribulation, Judgment Day, and, and the end. So this one, the thing about prophecy, though, that I want to share with you guys is that, you know, this stuff was written, this one, this one in particular was written five, about 585 B.C., roughly around that time. And all the, all the generations, all the peoples and stuff like that that have come through all the millennia that have studied the Word of God, that were students of the Word of God, could see their own time frame within prophecies. And that's why even now to this day, you know, there's, there's a lot of rise in, in prophecy studies and things like that and people talking about, you know, this is, this is the, the sign of the end time, you know, because beef costs 15 bucks a pound now and stuff like that. Every generation has looked at prophecy and said, it's prob this is it. This is our time. <clears throat> this is the end. Through Nero with the Christians, the Jews under Hitler. I mean, man, like every generation. But the thing is, I think it, it's kind of like, uh, in my opinion, this is my opinion, it's dad's way of keeping us on our toes, man. Because things do look like they'll line up and whatnot. Maybe they do. But no one knows the day or hour that Jesus is going to call us home, the rapture. And so, as Bible students and Christians, we ought to be looking at this thing like any second now because stuff does line up, and a lot of it does. You can see a lot of stuff in the New Testament, you know, that signs of the end times are everything that we're seeing around us right now. You know, the things that, especially the one that, uh, things that are right will be called wrong and things that are wrong will be called right. And I'm sure that most of you in this room can probably think, you know, pretty quickly about some of the things that you really consider wrong.
beat them, right? And then they get this big old chunk of land. And then all of a sudden, the Assyrian king dies, and his son takes over and goes, hey, man, we ain't putting up with this Baba, whatever the heck they are. And we're going to align with Moab. And then they get together, and they'll come back and take over this country over here. And it just kept going on and on and on. So I'm trying to track to see where the heck we really are. And as I kind of got through it here, I'm going to show you something that's really super cool, man. So let's start off in verse 6. And it goes like this. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud of his haughtiness and pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. Now, we're, as we're moving through this thing, you see a lot of political things going on here, a lot of political um, stuff within, within Moab, within Assyria, within Babylon, and things like that. But what we don't get to see in the midst of all this stuff is all the weirdo um, where the where these nations will come together, they were like fighting like, and all this happened like within a, like a century, maybe two at the most, where they're fighting with each other, and then all of a sudden, this one over here starts looking a little bit too big, and so we'll go over there and you know have a kumbaya with Pat and you know barbecue or whatever, and like hey let's get together and whoop him, and then they do, but like just five years later they were conquering each other and stuff like that. It's really bizarre how all this stuff played out. But the funniest part about it is they all thought they were running the program. The whole, all of these, as we go, as I went through all this stuff, all these kings really thought because of their pride and their haughtiness that they were calling the shots. And the whole time, God was right there directing the entire thing every step of the way. But because they wouldn't worship him and they were worshiping all these weirdo gods, <clears throat> he just kept coming in and wiping them out. So this Moab, though, they were huge, and they weren't always huge. In, in fact, they were kind of, eh, they, weren't, they weren't the best of tribes. We learned, you know, a couple weeks ago that Moab, the guy Moab, was actually uh, a child of an incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters. And then the other daughter pulled that off too. So they kind of came out bad right out the gate. Amen. And so there was always a, there was always a little bit of um, tension between Judah and Moab, but God still loved Moab. And I'm going to tell you right now, because even Isaiah, as we're talking about him there, people were tripping out like, why is God still liking these people? They're brutal. They're savages and all this stuff. But... From last week, we learned that out of Moab came Ruth, and out of Ruth, down the line came King David, and from David's line came who? Jesus Christ. That's right, the Messiah. So even though we might not see the plan, God's always got a plan. The problem with Moab was is they were so proud, and Moab, actually, I should say, that, that he, he and those, and, and just so you know, again, the leadership is where this is happening. The Moabites, by and large, were just like us. We're just, everything in here is so like, um, what is that word when you see something again after you saw it, but you don't know for sure if you really saw it? There it is, deja vu. Wow, deja vu, I knew you were going to say that. Um, like we, we live under a president and a, you know, a political party and stuff like that, and we have a couple different political parties, as you know. Well, in these days, even though there was a king, right, they had the same stuff going on. And if you really want to dig into that, then you read the book of Esther. Because you see in Esther all the different political things that were going on in there as well. So in the midst of all this, so you got to try to, to try to get it to where we can understand it. There's all this stuff going on inside. Some strive people kind of in battling and stuff like that. And trying to get this group over here to jump off with that group and, you know, create a revolt. And the whole time they're like battling off the Assyrians or battling off the Egyptians or teaming up with the Babylonians. And, and all this stuff is going on in a very short period of time. And none of them are worshiping God, except for Judah at this point. Because at this point, Hezekiah was the king. And he was a good king. Although, he ended up kind of blowing it with Assyria. But that's a little bit further down the road. So anyway... This guy and all his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, all the brutality and, and the, the uh, power and the, even the, the oppression of his own people said, but his lies shall not be so. They're not going to believe it. And as we get through this thing, you're going to see that people are starting to go, you know what? I ain't falling for that old banana the tailpipe trick this time, man. 
we've been listening to this stuff and this stuff, and all we're doing is getting hungry and dying over here. So, therefore, Moab shall wail for Moab. Moab shall wail for Moab. Everyone shall wail from the foundations of Ker Hereseth. You shall mourn, surely they are stricken. Now that Ker Hereshath is a really beautiful city. And and as we're going through this, if you can kind of the best place I can figure for you guys to think about is the Napa Valley. Anybody ever seen the Napa Valley? All the all the the vineyards that go on and on. Okay, that actually uh eh, it would be because San Bernardino is about three times the size of Israel, the whole thing. But if you could picture Napa Valley and all the beautiful rolling hills and stuff like that, the beautiful houses and all that, that's what Moab was proud about. And that's what Moab was fighting to keep and all that stuff. Well, all his people were seeing that everything was falling apart. Little by little, decisions were being made, kind of like uh, um, backroom deals, things like that. Kind of like a lot of the stuff that we have going on right now, alliances with other nations that we wouldn't want to be aligned with. All that stuff was going on back then, just like it's going on right now. And that should be alarming to all of us as we're reading through the Word of God, knowing that everything that we read tonight happened already, and it's going to happen again. And throughout the course of history, these things tend to repeat themselves, which is really bizarre to me, because even if you didn't read the Bible, certainly you could see what happened generationally to other countries. But the pride of man... It's brutal, man. You know, sometimes I know that I know that, you know, we're not prideful like that, where we would make bad decisions and things like that, you know, based on our pride. But these people. So anyway, the foundations of Cure Hereseth means that 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 basically means like a, a walled city, like kind of like a fortress. So what God's word is saying here, they're going to mourn from the, the most solid places of their society. From the bottom, you know, like the servants or whatever, all the way to the top, and all of them are going to be stricken. It's not going to just be like us peasants that are going to get nailed. It's going to be everybody that's going to get nailed. Now, check this out. I'm going to, I got to do this quick little history thing with, so we can understand this stuff. At that point, Moab began to revolt. So there was a, a revolt within Moab. At the same time this is going on, the Assyrians were, were, battling it out with um, Babylonia. But the dude's name was Nabopolassar. Does that sound familiar? Nabopolassar? That's because he's the dad of Nebuchadnezzar. And in 612, he took out Assyria. Remember we read about Assyria about two chapters ago and they were gone? That's the dude that did it and that's when it happened. So Assyria isn't in this part right now. This part is going to be all about Babylonia. But at the time... Babylonia was hooking up with, with Egypt to go back and try to take on what had come back up from uh, the Edomites, I think it was, one of those northern tribes. So that stuff's all going on up there. Well, we're talking about this stuff down here. So when, Neb, when Nabu, whatever his name, what did I say, Nabopolassar, when he died, and he, and check it out, that guy wasn't like a bad king. I mean, he was brutal. He was Babylonian, and he built a lot of cool stuff. But he was politically smart. He was just trying to like, get land and, and try to keep out of wars. But when he had to fight, he would gather with somebody else. Well, when his son took over, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a freaking lunatic. He was like a megalomaniac. And he just started sweeping across the land because now the Assyrians were out of his way. So he took out Egypt first. And then he started coming down to Judah. And then what did he get? Oh, he also, he got a... Uh, he got, the, he got Edom. Remember where Petra was at? So this is where we're picking this whole thing up with Moab right now. This big nation is all of a sudden, which normally could fight. They could like hold off anybody. But because there was what's going on like right here in this building, there was two groups going on. And they weren't agreeing with each other. And there was all this infighting and then this revolt. So Nebuchadnezzar had to deal with his own stuff that was going on inside there and then the battles were going on outside there and that's what weakened babylonia to the point that they could be taken out so check this out i got i got to get these numbers right because it's super important man remember this this prophecy was about 585 right so as we're kind of moving down here he took out egypt and jerusalem and Moab in 582, remember those numbers if you're writing, you're taking notes down. And this is where, this is what happened right here when that went on. 
Therefore, Moab shall wail. Okay, down here to eight. For the fields of Hezbon languish, and the vine of Shibma, the Lord of the nations, have broken down its choice plants. So these places I was just talking about here were renowned for their the choicest grapes, man, the choicest wine. People would come from everywhere to buy this stuff. There are these beautiful vineyards and these rolling hills and all that stuff. And when Babylon came through there, they came through and destroyed everything, trampled out all that stuff, burned it, killed all the people. That was the lords of the nations. The lords of the nations, the nations being pagan or non-Jew, and the lords were the kings. In this case, it was Babylon. And thinking here, thinking, 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 it was, it was just Babylon, because by now Nebuchadnezzar took out Egypt, Jordan, Edom, and Jerusalem or Judah. So right now Babylon is just getting bigger and this is the time that, that the Jews were, you know, captured all in this time. This is all happening at the same time. So now the Jews are being grabbed and taken to Babylon and the Babylonian captivity. Well, all this was still happening in Moab. It, I know it's confusing, but let's just keep moving. Which have, which have reached Jazar and wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out. They are gone over the sea. So Jazar is way north of the Dead Sea. And these, grape, these grapevines, uh, Shibma and Hezbon, went all the way from Jazar, they're like way up here, all the way down to the Dead Sea. And that's what this is talking about. They stretched out and they've gone over to the sea. Now, here's a cool thing you can write down if you want to. Jeremiah 48, 29 through 47. I'm not going to read it now because there's a lot there. It's the same prophecy in Jeremiah, but a little bit more detailed. You get a few more details of the same thing that we're talking about right now. And Jeremiah was prophesying to one group, and Isaiah was prophesying to another. And I don't think that anybody knew that the same word was coming from different prophets. Like Micah, all of them, they were, they were saying the same thing that God wanted them to say, but they were saying it to different people. Anyhow, I just thought that was pretty cool. Therefore, look what he says here. Is this thing like getting louder? Huh? No? Okay. Therefore... I will bewail the vine of Shibma with the sweeping of Jazer. I will drench you with my tears, O Hezbon and Elialia. Elialia had this amount. I worked on it for like a half hour. Eliela. Eliela. Okay. For battle cries have fallen over your summer fruits and your harvest. These people... Like any society, even our country right now, where we're joyful in our life. And by and large, we're pretty joyful, right? I mean, we got, we got it going on pretty good here in this country. And to the point where we become complacent. And we, we did that before 9-11. We got really complacent. Like, hey, man, nobody's coming to our country and doing anything. And then, you know, the World Trade Centers fall down and stuff like that. When we're together as a nation, we are a pretty invincible nation. I mean, short of like Pearl Harbor, which doesn't, I mean, it counts, it doesn't count because Hawaii is like, what, like 500 miles off the coast of California, so it wasn't like they got that close to us, right? Nobody? <sighs> anyway, man, we got complacent when we started dividing. And who was it? Who was that guy that said, united we stand, divided we fall? Well, like Benjamin Franklin or something like that? Anyway, it was one of them old guys that were doing all that stuff. This is what we started seeing happening here. There was all this joy and, and laughter and harvest that was plentiful. People weren't hungry. Beautiful buildings. I mean, Babylon was known for some amazing structures that they built. But as the, as the infighting began to start, as people from one group started saying, well, I don't like that the way that's going on because... When we were hanging out with the Egyptians, you know, beating up on the Assyrians, I met this guy right here, and they got some really cool stuff that they're doing. Now, I know it doesn't line up with Nebuchadnezzar's thing, but nonetheless, I think we have the right, so to speak. And that's where all this infighting started. And what it did was it weakened the nation. Now, our nation is going through a little infighting, too. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. There's a lot of things that are happening in our nation, and here's the weird thing about it. It's kind of like when we stand together and we sing, we sing the national anthem, you know, it, we're proud because it's our national anthem, and we, you know, we honor our flag, we love our flag, we die for our flag, and then 
some groups start coming in and going, hey, I want to burn that flag, man. And you're like, hey, what the heck are you talking about? And then there's like this little strife thing going on. Well, while all that's happening, others outside are watching. And that's what was going on back in these days. The other nations would watch. And when another nation started wobbling and getting weak, boom, they'd go in and take them out. And the crazy thing is they would literally conquer them and then like take them prisoner and all that stuff. And then they would start doing the same old goofy stuff and another nation would see them like the Assyrians and they would come in and wipe them out. Then they'd grab all those people and take them over there. And it was like this movement that was going around. I was reading these charts and stuff and I'm like, man, how the heck do you keep track of all this stuff? But the single thread through the whole thing was that God was in the whole thing and knew exactly what was happening every step of the way. But these Nimrods just couldn't catch on to all that stuff. Anyhow, so as we're looking through all this stuff, the prophecy that was fulfilled about Assyria, that was fulfilled. Prophecy about Babylon was fulfilled. But what we're talking about tonight is Moab. And the reason I want to focus in on Moab and all these times that I'm telling you is because Isaiah put a number on it. And generally in prophecy, prophecy is generalized, you know? Okay, this is going to happen. Like, watch, I'll show you. I'll give you an example. So my prophecy is, when I throw this hammer as hard as I can toward that back door, it's going to hit somebody back there, right? Is that fair enough? I mean, that's a good prophecy, right? I mean, kind of a guess. Actually, you know what? I can hit a moving target. From, I'm, the poor girl didn't even see it coming. In this case, though, Isaiah put a number on it, and based on the kings, based on the time frame that all this was happening, we can zero it down to a very tight little spot, and, and God did that, and I believe God did that just for us, so that we could see that if we weren't sure that he was in charge, this proves that he was in charge. So this is what's happening now, is all this stuff is, is starting to burn down and get trampled and all that, and verse 10, gladness is taken away. This is what we have to pay attention to in our own country right now. And I would ask you guys right now, how's your gladness holding up? Based on 2020, things that we went through, um, based on political issues that are going on, one of the toughest for me is cancel culture the things that are being uh, canceled, because I, I dig history. I love history, and the thought of removing it yes. is absurd to me. Even if it's wrong, history is still history. You can't just erase it, although nations have tried to do it time and time again, and you know what? It never worked out. History has a way of always winning. So as we're looking through this stuff, listen to what it says here. Kind of think of us right now in our time. So the joy... Gladness is taken away, and joy from the plentiful field. In the vineyards there will be no singing, nor will there be shouting. No treaders will tread out wine in the presses. I have made their shouting cease. <clears throat> little by little, things are taken away, taken away, taken away, taken away. And before long, what used to be your nation... As you remember it and you saw it, you were raised up, is a very different place. Now, <clears throat> keeping in mind that when, when nations took over other nations, of course they brought in all their own stuff, right? Their own um, religions and their own worshiping, their own idols and things like that. But by and large, people will always remember who they are. And in, in what's happening in Moab right now is it's almost like, you know, they, the prophecy was they're going to be wiped out, but... It would have been better if they just got like, like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a slow process, and the reason it's a slow process is that dad is continuing to be patient and patient and patient. Now, I don't know if, if you need God's patience in your life right now. I'm sure you guys are all just rocking it and everything. No need to worry about that. In this case, God was trying to bring him back and trying to bring him back, and now I know sometimes people go, well, this is going on in my life, that's going on in my life, and I just don't understand why God is allowing this to happen in my life. And I always want to tell them, so when was the last time you really got transparent with God about your life and really just stood before the king and go, okay, you know what? <clears throat> what is it that's going on in my life that's not pleasing to you? There's a, pro there's a song that says, search my heart, O oh God, which is a scary thing to do with God. It just might be that 
some of the things that we're doing, um, saying, believing even, are contrary to God's word. And sometimes it's really easy to take like that particular page, like this one right here that says, you know, whatever is going on in your life, and tear it out of the Bible. Then you can just skip from that one to this one. You don't really have to face that consequence. And then poof, it's gone, right? You don't need to worry about it. You know, the thing about the Bible, though, is that God wrote every word of it. So even if you tear a page out, he's going to know it. <laughs> Amen? And he's going to know what's going on in your life. And he gives us all kinds of room. In this case, they refused to come back. They refused to be obedient. They kept attacking Judah, and God kept telling them not to. So this is what happened from God's heart. Verse 11, Therefore my heart shall resound like a harp for Moab, and my inner being for Kir Heres. And Kir Heres means beautiful city. Because that's how God saw it. Just like God sees the Napa Valley, or the mountains, or you, or anybody, it's all beautiful to God. The, the sin... And the ugliness, of course not. But his heart breaks. He doesn't get joy from destroying. God's a creator, man. He is the great cre creator. And so he's saying here that his heart is ringing, like wailing. The, the best way to kind of describe it is like, you ever heard a whale cry or sing? Anybody ever heard that? Can anybody do a whale sing? Take a shot at it? Nobody? Maybe? I don't know. I, I remember that from a Zeppelin song. Anyway, from his, what he's talking about here, you know, there's a, there's a version that says, from my, uh, from my bowels. From my, my bowels. And, and, you know, that kind of sounds a little bit gross. But the point is, from the very depths of God's heart and love, it does break God's heart to destroy. He would have it that everybody comes home. But the fact is, this stinking pride is tearing this place apart. So here's what happens. So now Moab is getting weary. And I don't mean Moab the dude, Moab the nation. They're getting weary. And look what happens here in verse 12. And it shall come to pass, when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that he will come to his sanctuary to pray, but he will not prevail. So the high places, you know, where, where they did all the weirdo worshiping and idol worship and all that stuff, because that's what they were told to do. And... Anytime that you're told to do something and you kind of do it and you get in, maybe it's not your thing or whatever, but you know, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We do. And then someone comes along and goes, okay, yeah, but we're not going to do it like that anymore. Now we're going to do it like this. And you're like, ah, okay, now we're going to start going that direction. And then you go for it. And then someone else comes along and goes, okay, you know, we're not going to do it like that. We're going to do it like this. In fact, that statue over there that you guys have been worshiping, that pole and stuff like that, we're tearing it down. What? That's our, that's our God thing. Well, not anymore. Because we don't, we don't like it, we're not going to have it, we're going to tear it down, and we're going to replace it with this. And you look into that thing, you go, now, wait a minute, man. I wouldn't be caught dead on a moped, and I ain't going to worship that thing. Well, if you don't worship it, then you die, or you can split, you can get out. That's what was happening right here. One thing after another, as leaders kind of came and went and things like that, they became weary of all of that. Because all this stuff is, being, is happening and being changed and all this kind of political nonsense while the country is being laid waste. The people are going, we don't care about your stupid moped. What we care about is the fact that our grapevines are being trampled. All the fields and all the, the grain and everything is being wiped out. Well, you guys, you important people, are over here bickering and fighting. Does that even kind of sound familiar to anybody in this room? And here's the sad part. The end is the sad part. We, we know how it goes. We know how it's going to end. And, and what they do is, when, when they get tired of all that, the Moab, the people, if you will, they, they fall back. What it, what it says here, then, they came, then, then he will come to a sanctuary and pray, but he won't prevail. What, what sanctuary do they go back to? I know you, and immediately as Christians, we think church, right? Well, a sanctuary is a safe place. And so whatever they felt like, was their safe place? You know where you know where drug drug addicts go sometimes, or alcoholics, when things don't work out. They, yeah, jail. <laughs> they fall back to a time when they felt like they were in control. In their addiction, 
And people fall back to all kinds of goofy stuff. But the problem with all this is they're not falling back to God. Because there comes a point in time after people have been led down these different paths that they forget. This is why Isaiah is here, just so you know. This very, what we're reading right here, God sent Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and Amos, all these prophets. He sent them to remind the people of who God was. Because they've been so far gone, they've been out there for so long, and they've been doing all this stuff that when all hell was breaking loose, they're standing there like lost little children because they really didn't know where to go and what to do. Their sanctuary was not a sanctuary of God. It was a sanctuary of maybe hiding under a rock. It was definitely not the high place. That wasn't working out anymore. And so it's kind of a sad story as we're watching these people now kind of cower back with nothing to stand on. Now, in our nation right now, we're a Christian nation, right? We're a nation built on God, right? Do you know that, uh, I was just talking to someone about this the other day, that not maybe three, I don't know, four decades, maybe, maybe in the 80s or something like that, church attendance was like in the 80s percentile. And then by the 90s, it was down around in the low 70s. And now in the 10s that we're in right now, Church attendance is closer to the low 60s and getting into the 50s. And what I mean by that is when they do their censuses, people that identify as Christian. That's how much it's dropped just in over 30 or 40 years. What do you suppose it's going to look like in 20 years if we don't get off our butt and do something about it? Right? And, and I believe part of the reason is, is people just don't know how to do anything about it, honestly. I also think that part of the reason is the, what do you call that when... Politically correct. People are afraid to say anything to anybody now. You don't even know what to say anymore. You don't know what to, how to address them, how to talk to them. So it's easier just to do what? Nothing, right? Okay, you know what that is right there? I'll give you the biblical verse of that. He will come to a sanctuary and pray, but he will not prevail. That's what that means. When we shrink back away from God to our own little safe place, maybe it's your church. Maybe your church is your little safe place. Maybe it's a bigger church, you know, and bigger churches are easier to hide in than this one. We can pretty much see everything in this one. Sometimes a big church is a place you can go and hide in the back, and you don't need to worry about anything. You don't need to talk to anybody, but you're going to pray, right? You're going to pray? How many of you really do pray about stuff you say you're going to pray about? Whoa, look at all of you, man. God's watching, too. Praise the Lord. So he's going to be expecting to hear from you here tonight. Amen? Now, that same census was that 20% out of 100% of people cop to the fact that they don't pray regularly in America right now. And that's our greatest weapon, man. But for whatever reason, you got things like technology and the media, things like that that are constantly bombarding our head. We have to look at this stuff and go, well, hey, check it out. God gave us a roadmap out of this madness right here. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on. But let me show you what he thought about Moab. Um, actually, let me do one more verse. This is the word which, which the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. Now look at, look at me over at Psalms real quick. Psalm 108. 108 verse 8 and 9. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet of my head. And Judah is my lawgiver. That's solid stuff. Moab is my wash pot. And that's how God saw Moab. And you know what a wash pot was for? Washing feet. Dirty feet. It was a place that in a house when you went in and you'd stick your feet in there and some slave or you know, servant or whatever would, would wash your feet. So why would God call Moab a wash pot? Do you think that was a shot at Moab? Because it's just a dirt bag country? Don't worship him. So you know what? He's like my toilet. He didn't call him a toilet. He called him a wash pot. And there's a really good reason for that. Because God sent people to Moab to clean them up. Anybody ever been to Cabazon in here? Okay. Cabazon was Moab. <laughs> God's wash pot. He sent people like me to go get washed. And it wasn't fun. If you've ever been there, you know that it wasn't fun. Actually... How many have never been to Cabazon before? A lot of you? Okay. So, you know, they got like, um, 
They got like water slides and horseback riding, you know, stuff like that. They got indoor theaters and things that you get to hang out on, right? Look, you guys are going, heck, man, that ain't the cabazon I went to, man. Actually, if, if that was it, I probably would have made a mistake and ended up at the casino, and that would have been more like that. Cabazon was a place that was difficult, and so was Moab. Now, remember who came out of Moab? Ruth came out of Moab. And because of Ruth, we have the line that led all the way to Jesus. Where do those Jews end up going in the end times? The ones that were rejected God, rejected Jesus pre-trib, at the end of trib, that remnant, where did they end up going because they turned to God and Jesus Christ, actually? They went to Moab. They went right there to Edom where Petra is, and God uses that stuff. So just because something looks like it might be a shot at someone, it's not necessarily a shot. It's a warning. Sometimes us, we need to go to Moab to get cleaned up a little bit. It's not fun to go before the Lord and go, okay, Lord, you know what? I suck. I'm a sinner. I blah, 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 blah. But you know, when you come out the other side of the wash pot, man, you're clean. Doesn't mean you're never going to sin again, right? But to get right with God is all they needed to do. But here's what happened. Back to verse 14. But now, with, but now the Lord has spoken, saying, within three years, there's that number I was telling you about. Within three years, as the years of a hired man. That's a really cool thing. As we've been going through Isaiah, there's all these weird little things. You, get. you know what the years of a hired man are? Anybody? Want to take a shot at that one? Okay, so if you sold yourself into slavery, maybe you had to pay a debt, maybe your family owed money, whatever the case was. Sold yourself for three years. Three years' time is what you're going to work for whatever it is. Would you not know the exact day every single day of those three years until you got down to zero, right? Anybody ever been in jail here? That's an easy one. You been to jail, Amy? Okay. So when you got a release date, your release date is September 14th. Do you not know exactly how many days it is to September 14th? Okay, that's what that is the years of a hired man. Because every day in that servitude, they're counting down the days. You can walk up to that guy at any part and go, so how much uh, time you got for you free? 306 days. And four hours. Five minutes. That's what that meant. What God's word is telling us here is it's precise. It's exact, right? So he goes like this. The Lord has spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of the hired man, the glory of Moab will be despised. With all that great multitude and all the remnant will be very small and feeble. Okay, so here's what happened. In that, in that mad rush of Nebuchadnezzar, when he, go, he went through the whole Middle East, the whole Israel, all around the Dead Sea, wiping out stuff like that, Moab got swept through in 582. That's when Babylon came through and took out Moab and wiped them out, man. There was just a few, a few people. And, and actually, after 582, you don't even see Moab in history anymore. The Moabites just disappeared. What remnant was there kind of assimilated into Judah at that point because they were kind of, you know, they were from the seed of Abraham, even though it was a weird, you know, freaky deaky thing with, eight, with Lot and his daughter. They still assimilated in, and then Moab was no more. But here's the crazy thing. This prophecy that we're reading right now was, was about 585 B.C. And you know, when you're going B.C., you go backwards, right? Like, we go upwards, well, back then we go backwards. So if Isaiah wrote this in 585, and Nebuchadnezzar came through Moab in 582 and wiped him out, how much, how much time does that? Three years, man. And... This isn't biblical stuff I'm talking about. That, that's historical fact of how these nations came through and battled. And, and, I, and man, I was crunching numbers all day long. Well, not all day, but pretty much all day. Going through the Assyrians' timeline, the Babylonian Assyrians, the Edomites, just to try to see if I could disprove it. And you know what? I couldn't. The fact of the matter is God's word was right. And Isaiah was bold, man. Because he put his whole reputation on the line right here. Because if that didn't happen in that time frame, 
It's like I said, it's way easier to throw a vague prophecy out there. Anybody can do that. I'll give you a prophecy right now. I'll prophesy something right now. Okay, one day, Jesus is going to call us all home by the blowing of a trumpet, and we will all be raptured out. One day soon, I'll go even further than that. Right? Are you guys impressed with my prophecy? But when do you think it's going to happen? Any idea? We don't know, man. But Isaiah put a number on it, man, and it happened just the way Isaiah said it was going to happen. I just think that stuff is like absolutely incredible, amen? Anyway, as we kind of went on, Babylon was taking on all this stuff. Remember, the Assyrians were gone now. Judah was in captivity. Edom was gone. Moab was gone. Egypt was struggling, man. They were just trying to hang on. You always think of the pharaohs, you know, like, let my people go. Well, they were pretty bad to the bone before everyone started kicking their butt. And then they had a bunch of infighting, too. And the nations got weaker, weaker. You know who was coming up from the backside and no one was paying attention to it? The Medes. And the Medes even jumped in with Babylonians way back in the beginning. But now they came together with Persia after they had a little battle. And they said, hey, let's quit fighting, man. What's, where's the beef? Let's get together and go kick Nebuchadnezzar's butt. And you know what they did? They came rushing down in at 539 B.C. and wiped out Babylon grabbed all those prisoners they had and then that's where we pick up the story of Esther right there isn't that interesting or is it just me <laughs> I think it's really interesting man okay here's the get it I know this one's kind of technical tonight but we had to kind of get through all that stuff so that we can go into the next one and next week Damascus is getting their teeth kicked out yeah uh, it happens Okay, so here's the get it. Is pride really that dangerous in dad's eye? Yeah. It clearly, right? And, it, and it's not just because, I mean, it's not that dad's afraid of us or our pride. I mean, if, if he certainly wasn't afraid of Lucifer's pride, he's certainly not going to be afraid of our pride, right? What, what would, why would dad consider it so dangerous then? Because the pride is what pulls us away from him and his son. And it's easy to fall away from that stuff Especially, I'm going to tell you something right now, man. Back in, in these days, you know, they didn't have telephones yet. Back in 5-something B.C. They, the communication was very different than it is right now. If you think about how long it would take for somebody to get message 100 miles away, to share his thing with him 100 miles away, how long that would take? How long do you think it would take right now to get a message to someone that's 100 miles away? I mean, in terms of nanoseconds, right? The, the, the information highway, we, we are in such a time that we literally in this room can communicate with someone in the Amazon if we had a phone number that we could connect to. Have you ever thought about that? Or in Russia, maybe deep, deep in the middle of China, if you had a phone number, you could talk to someone and tell them about Jesus. But the other side has that same technology. And the thing is, they're using it way better than we are. Way better than we are. We need to step up our game, you guys. I mean, a lot of us get on social media, and we get in those stupid keyboard wars going on. Think about this for just a second. I'm not pinning nobody down. If you spent half the time that you spend on Facebook or wherever, either fighting with someone or just, you know, putting stuff on there. If you just took 50% of that time and strictly devoted it to sharing the word of God, how effective do you think you would be for the kingdom of God? Powerful. Extremely powerful. But we're in the mindset too. We got caught up in the same tsunami and that's what goes on with these things and we got to get it. All these nations like, like Assyria, for instance, they, they, it was Judah back in Ahaz in, uh, in Judah he hired the Assyrians to come and protect him, right? And he, he unleashed a tsunami, and he couldn't stop it. We have tsunamis coming at us in all kinds of ways right now, man. And we, we fight back, and we're like, I don't believe in that. I'm not falling for that. There ain't no way I'm going for that right there, man. Well, check it out. Is that really our responsibility as Christians to point our fingers and say, I don't like this, I don't like that. I'm not going to believe on that. I'm not going to do that. Our responsibility is to believe on the word of God and God only in Christ and Christ crucified and start moving forward that way. If we gather enough Christians together, 
I'm here to tell you something right now, man. Things would radically change, but at some point, we've got to stop sneaking back into our sanctuary and tucking ourselves down in the pew where it's safe. Because I'm telling you, it ain't going to be safe for long. And furthermore, there's people outside that door that don't know what you know, and they don't have the relationship you have with Christ. And when all hell breaks loose out there, and I'm not trying to lay any, the guilt trip on anybody, I'm just telling you, we have power. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. It's time to get up out of our little hiding places and start acting like men and women of God. Amen? Just my opinion. Don't throw anything. The second one is this. Is Dad willing to destroy things of beauty? Absolutely, man. Before I crashed and burned and got saved, I was an underwear model. <laughs> yeah, so God will destroy a thing of beauty. <laughs> Get it? Anyway, yeah. You know what's funny about the destroying thing of beauty? What we, what we behold is the most beautiful and remarkable thing we've ever seen ever in our whole life. We'll never compare to anything that we'll see in heaven. Never, ever, ever. Okay, last thing here. Dad's word is final, and nothing can change it. That's just the way it is, you guys. So either we're, we're in it, or we're n out of it, or we're trying to straddle, you know, that lukewarm thing. You know where you find the lukewarm Christians at? Hiding in the sanctuary. And we just read it right there. And we saw the result of it. It didn't go well. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Father, and... Lord, we know there's a lot of stuff going on in there, Father, a lot of technical stuff, but it all matters, Lord, that we can understand that your word is perfect. And not only perfect, it's precisely perfect, Lord, that we can truly follow your word, we can believe in your word, we can stand on your word, Lord. Father, we have something that we can take to the world, Lord, not, not in battle, Father, but in love and in mercy and grace, just like you showed upon us. So as we pray tonight, Father, our desire is that everybody knows your son as, as your son, Jesus, the Savior, whether here in this building tonight or out there in video land somewhere, that as we pray this prayer, this is their moment as they feel that tugging of the Holy Spirit to come to your son as Savior. So as we pray, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit move through this room, move through that camera right there, Lord and touch those that you'll have brought. So, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Let's all pray together. Father God, I sin against you, Lord, and, I've asked you for, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. He's awesome. I know that was a lot, but... It, sometimes it has to be that way as we're going through Isaiah. But anyway, um, did we talk about baptism? I wasn't in the room. We've got baptism coming up. Has anybody, uh, has anybody never been baptized in here? Y'all been, everyone been baptized in here? Yeah? Okay, if you haven't, sign up over there. Because I'm going to do, do a Bible. If we, ha if we have, you know, we have one person, then we're going to devote that whole night to baptism. But if you've never been baptized, and you, but you've seen it where they put them under water and stuff like that, you know, and it's a beautiful thing and all that, it's a little bit different here. <laughs> but you'll never forget it. Amen. Hey, you know what, you guys? Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys.